Lucene is a kind of information retrieval system, or IR system for short. An IR system offers search capability over a body of information, most commonly textual information, such as in a web search service like Google Search. An IR system collects a corpus of information, usually in units called documents, and processes these documents to construct an index, some kind of data structure that allows the corpus of documents to be searched relatively quickly. Without indexing, an IR system would have to perform searches by brute force, by reading through potentially every single piece of information in its corpus, and that obviously would be really slow when the corpus is more than trivial in size. Web search, for example, would be totally impractical if it had to rely upon the brute force approach. The core building block of text search in most information retrieval systems is what's called an inverted index, or sometimes called a postings file. An inverted index is some kind of collection that allows us to quickly look up a specific term and its associated postings list, a list of the numeric IDs of documents which contain that term. So, for example, if the term pizza is present in some of the documents in our corpus, the inverted index allows us to quickly access a list of IDs for those documents. Note that the documents themselves are not stored in the inverted index, and so must be stored elsewhere if we need to access them. How documents are stored and retrieved by their ID numbers is a separate problem. So the inverted index is basically just a big map in which terms are associated with lists of document IDs. The important question then is, what exactly is a term? You might naively answer that each word in a document is a term, but text is generally more complicated than that. What about punctuation? What about numbers? What about variations in spelling? Do we care about capitalization? Should we omit very common words like the? Should words with common roots really be separate terms? Should the plural cats match the singular cat? Depending upon exactly what search behavior we desire and what performance and storage use trade-offs we're willing to make, we'll have different answers to these questions. Ideally, users would be able to perform any kind of search query on an index very quickly, but this isn't always feasible. For example, sometimes when doing a web search, I want to find documents matching an exact sequence of characters, punctuation included, and only that sequence of characters. But for the sake of performance and limiting storage use, web search services like Google omit most punctuation marks when they index web pages, so such searches simply can't be done on their indexes. The process of selecting terms from a document is called analysis, and the core part of analysis is tokenization, in which we split our document text into substrings. Each substring, along with its position, character offset, and length, makes up an individual token. For example, if we tokenize the text Queen Victoria by simply splitting along white space, the first token is Queen at position 0 because it's the first token, offset 0 because its first character is the first character in the whole text, and with length 5 because Queen has 5 characters. The second token would be Victoria at position 1, because it's the second token, offset 6, because its first character is the seventh character in the whole text, and with length 8, because Victoria has 8 characters. Once we have a document broken down into a bunch of tokens, we can index it such that each unique token string becomes a term. Now, if we wish to perform queries which depend not just upon which documents contain which terms, but which also depend upon where the terms are located in those documents and how frequently, then we must also retain each token's position and offset information in the index. The postings list would then look something like this. For each occurrence of the term, we record the position and character offset. Here we have two occurrences, the fourth token in the text, which starts at the 21st character, and the 26th token in the text, which starts at the 198th character. You may wonder why we didn't include the token length. First, few types of queries need this length information, and second, the token length can generally just be inferred from the matching term. When we look up the postings list for the term pizza, the matching tokens should all be of length 5. However, this is not always the case, because analysis might convert text snippets that don't exactly match pizza into pizza. For example, an analyzer that emits punctuation marks would convert both PIZZ% A and PI number sign dollar sign at symbol Z exclamation mark ZA to pizza. So, depending upon our search needs and our analysis, we might include token lengths or we might not. That actually covers the essence of building an index. Obviously, though, the actual implementation of indexing requires great concern with the precise index data structures because the details dictate how efficiently we can look at the terms and their associated postings lists, which is a very good reason why you'll probably want to use an existing solution like Lucene. Getting all those details right can be very tricky and take a lot of work.
In any case, once we have our index, we can perform queries on it of several different kinds. The most obvious kind is a term query in which we look up all documents containing an exactly matching term. For example, if we perform a term query for cat, we get back all document IDs in the postings list for the term cat and just cat. Our results should not include the postings of any other term, whether cats, catalog, catamaran, or dog, just cat, C-A-T, the full term character for character. Be clear, however, that again, depending upon our analysis, the term cat in the index might represent tokens in the documents that don't exactly match cat. The idea of a term query, however, is that whatever terms end up in our index, a term query does a precise match for one of those terms. A wildcard query allows us to look up partial term matches by denoting fill-in-the-blank sections of our terms. By convention, these fill-in-the-blank sections are denoted with an asterisk character. For example, a wildcard search for f asterisk t asterisk er will match any term that begins with f, includes a t in the middle, and ends in er, such as father, fatter, fighter, or freighter. The query cat asterisk will match cat, cats, catalog, and catamaran. The query asterisk cat will match cat, fat cat, scat, and copycat. Unfortunately, the algorithms that find wildcard matches are relatively costly, and so they are disfavored or disallowed in many search systems. However, finding old terms beginning with a sequence of characters, a prefix query, like cat asterisk, can generally be handled as a special case with a much more efficient algorithm. The same cannot be said of finding all terms ending with a sequence of characters, a suffix query, like asterisk cat. To look up all the terms with a particular suffix, you're stuck using the same inefficient algorithm for the general case of a wildcard query. The idea of a fuzzy query is that we want to find inexact matches of a term by specifying the degree of inexactitude to allow. This inexactitude, this level of mismatch, is measured by the degree of difference in character edits. For example, the difference between pizza and pizza with one Z is one character edit, the removal of a Z. So if we perform a fuzzy query for the term cat and allow for two character edits, the query will match terms like cat, pat, path, bat, bath, act, Kathy, cape, cot, cod, cap, zap, and so forth, because all these terms have two character edits difference from cat. The great thing about fuzzy searches is that they accommodate typos and misspellings. The downside is that like wildcard searches, Fuzzy searches are generally much more costly to perform than searches for exact term matches. If we record term positions in our index, we can also perform phrase queries. A phrase query is a query in which we match on multiple terms occurring in a certain order or within a certain proximity of each other. Most commonly, phrase queries are used to find a specific sequence of adjacent terms. For example, we could perform a phrase query for the terms George and Washington adjacent to each other and in that order such that a query will return the documents that contain the whole phrase George Washington, not just George and Washington separately or in the opposite order. A range query matches all terms that fall within a numeric or alphabetic range. For example, we can search for all numbers from 100 to 200, which would match 130, 174, 120, etc. If we search for the range apple to orange, it would match all terms that fall alphabetically in between as they would in a dictionary, such as banana, fire truck, or obtuse. Optionally, we can make a range query inclusive, such that, say, a range search on apple to orange would also match the terms apple and orange themselves. Whether a range query can be performed with reasonable efficiency depends upon both the breadth of the queried range and how exactly the index data is structured. In Lucene, while range queries are certainly less efficient than simple term queries, they are still fairly efficient. Lastly, a Boolean query composites multiple other queries together, combining their results into one result set. The reason we call it a Boolean query, instead of just a composite query, is that we can use Boolean logic to include or exclude matching documents of each subquery. For example, a Boolean query could match all documents from one subquery, but exclude all documents from another subquery. So we could find, say, all documents which have the term cat, but which also do not have the term dog. So that about covers the possibilities for how we might query index to find a set of documents. But we're missing a vital aspect of most search applications. Finding a set of matching documents is only one half the problem. The other half is to sort those matching documents, generally with the best matches sorted to the top. A web search query, for example, typically matches thousands if not millions of web pages, and so web search would be virtually worthless without sorting of the best, most relevant matches to the first page or two of results. 
This sorting process is often called scoring because each matching document in the query result set is evaluated and given a score, with the best matches given the highest scores. In a typical application that offers search, search results are presented in descending order of score with only the top 20 or 30 matches shown unless the user requests to see more. There are many ways to go about scoring documents as different search applications call for different approaches. Perhaps the most common approach though, and the default offered in Lucene, is the vector space model using TF-IDF weights. When described formally in terms of vectors and cosines, the model sounds complicated, but the TF-IDF part is actually easy to understand. TF stands for term frequency, as in how many times a particular term appears in a document. DF stands for document frequency, meaning the percentage of documents which contain that particular term. The I stands for inverse, so IDF is the total number of documents divided by the number of documents containing the term. The idea of TF-IDF weighting is that intuitively, higher term frequency should result in a higher score because a document with many occurrences of a query term is a better match than documents with fewer occurrences. Likewise, higher document frequency of a term should result in a lower score because the more common the query term is found in other documents, the less special any particular document with that term. By lowering the scores for common terms, we give stronger weight to uncommon terms and appropriately return low scores for documents which match only common terms. If I perform, say, a web search for a common English word like car, even the top results should have low scores to reflect their likely low relevance. So to get a document score with TF-IDF weighting, we simply divide TF by DF. As term frequency goes up, the score goes up proportionally, but as document frequency goes up, the score goes down proportionally. Usually, however, this formula is expressed as term frequency multiplied by the inverse document frequency, which of course is the mathematical equivalent. I'm not certain why we multiply inverse document frequency instead of divide document frequency, but this is the convention. If I had to guess at the reason, I'd say it's because multiplication is generally a faster operation for computers, and therefore this makes queries faster to score. Again, TF-IDF certainly isn't the only basis for scoring, but it's the most commonly useful. Depending on your application, you may wish to incorporate different factors. Google, for example, owes most of its early success to PageRank, a system that scores web pages based on how commonly that page is linked by other web pages. Google's scoring system has evolved greatly since its early days, but PageRank is still an important factor. Before getting into details of how Lucene works and how to use it, we should describe exactly what Lucene is. In short, Lucene is a Java library for creating and querying textual indexes. Lucene is developed and maintained by the Apache organization, and it's likely the text search library most widely used today. If for whatever reason you want to use Lucene but don't want to use Java, you have a few options. A port of Lucene to C-sharp is available called Lucene.net, though it generally lags behind Java Lucene and feature parity by a couple years. PyLucene is not actually a port of Lucene to Python, but instead makes Lucene available to your Python code by embedding the JVM in the Python interpreter. Solar, another Apache project, provides Lucene's text search capability in the form of a server. By providing text search as a network service, Solar allows you to interface with Lucene text indexes from any programming language. Solar also effectively allows you to easily offload text search to separate machines, which is very advantageous for many applications. If you don't mind configuring and managing a server, Solar may be your best option even if you're using Java, because compared to Lucene, it provides some extra capabilities and simplifies some common use cases. In this video, however, we'll only cover the direct use of Lucene itself. When using Lucene, there are a couple other tools you'll likely need. The Tika library is another closely associated Apache project. Tika extracts the text content and meta information from a wide variety of file formats, such as PDFs and other document formats. So if you want to index files in a Lucene index, you first use Tika to get the text from the files. The other very useful tool is Luke, a program that provides a user interface for inspecting and modifying Lucene indexes, which comes in very handy as you develop and fine tune your application search functionality. The logical units which Lucene indexes are not actually individual strings, but rather what Lucene calls documents. Each document is made up of any number of named fields. So for example, a Lucene document representing an email message might look like this. Here we have four fields presented in no particular order, sender, recipient, date, and message. The values of the fields don't actually have to be strings. They can be any kind of binary data. When this document is created and indexed, Lucene gives it a unique document ID number, and each field is indexed in a separate posting list. 
For example, the string I need that report ASAP is analyzed and for each resulting term, the ID of this document is added to the message field postings list associated with that term. So for example, assuming report is one of these tokens, the term report in the inverted index will have the ID of this document in its associated message field postings list. Lucene is often called schema lists because we don't have to specify what our data will look like ahead of time. At any time, we can add a document with fields of any name, and the postings list for each field simply gets created as needed. So if, in our example, the term report already existed in the index but had no associated message field postings list, Lucene will simply create one as needed. Again, a key thing to understand when indexing is that portions of the data may get discarded in analysis, and so the inverted index generally won't contain the full original data. For example, if we feed Lucene's default analyzer, the English text, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it will extract just three tokens, best, worst, and time, because that analyzer discards small common words and punctuation marks and drops the plural s at the end of words. Even when analysis happens to retain the full original data of a field in the inverted index, actually retrieving the data is impractical because it would require piecing together every occurrence of every term, and that would require scanning every posting list. After all, an inverted index is structured for fast lookups of documents by term, not fast lookups of terms by document. So in Lucene, actual field data is stored separately from the inverted index in separate files ending in the extension .fdt, short for field data table. The fields of a single document are stored contiguously in this file, so it is generally more efficient to retrieve multiple fields of a single document than to retrieve the same number of fields from different documents. For the most common use cases of Lucene, this is the appropriate trade-off because, usually, the point of a search is to identify and retrieve a small number of documents. However, there are legitimate use cases where you might need to quickly retrieve fields from many documents. For such cases, Lucene has two mechanisms, one called field cache, and a newer alternative, a special kind of field called doc values. I won't give the details here, but in short, the idea behind both of these features is to store values together by field instead of together by document. So for example, all values of the date field would be kept in their own collection, apart from values of other fields, making it fast to retrieve many date values of many different documents. Keep in mind though that for the cases where we need to retrieve field values from only a small number of documents, the conventional stored field mechanism would likely be more efficient, as it would consume less memory and require fewer lookups. Now, storing each field in each document is actually optional because, somewhat surprisingly, it's fairly common to need a field indexed but not stored. For example, if we're creating an index of books, maybe we only want to index the content but not store it because we're storing the books elsewhere in PDF format, and so storing their text in our Lucene index would just be redundant. In other cases, we may wish to have documents field stored but not indexed. For example, in a book search, even if we don't index the titles because we don't ever want to search by title, we'll probably want to store the titles. Be clear that a query on our indexed fields only returns a list of document IDs. To display a document's information in our search results, we have to be able to somehow look up that information from the document's ID. Thus, we would probably store book titles even if we don't index them, because generally we would want to show the titles in our search results. Most commonly, a Lucene index is stored as a collection of files in a directory. I won't go into the details of these various files, except to mention that Lucene's developers decided early on that Lucene index files should never be modified once created. The upside of this decision is that it greatly reduces the possibility of index corruption. The downside is that it makes updating an index less efficient. When documents are added to an existing Lucene index, the new documents are stored in a new segment, a logically separate set of index files. Each segment, in truth, has all the information of an independent index, each complete with its own inverted index of terms, along with everything else. So these segments can actually be queried separately, which in fact is just what Lucene does when we query an index. Lucene performs the same query on each segment, but collects all the hits into one result set. Thus, the separate segments appear to queries as one logical unit. Obviously, having to query multiple indices makes a search slower, and so Lucene endeavors to periodically merge segments together. For example, Lucene combines the data of segments A and B to create segment C, and once segment C is fully written to disk, Lucene deletes segments A and B. Unless you have a very large index and concerns about overly large files, the ideal number of segments at any moment is usually one. 
As you might imagine though, the merging process is quite costly, especially for large segments, so we generally don't want merging performed every time our index is updated. So when exactly do segments get merged? Well, you can explicitly merge segments yourself, but merges may trigger automatically as well. When writing to an index, an instance of the merge policy class is specified, and when new segments are created, Lucene invokes the merge policies find merges method, which returns a list of segments to merge. The actual merging of these segments is performed by a specified instance of the merge scheduler class. The default merge policy is an instance of tiered merge policy, which prefers to merge segments of approximately equal size when it can. The default merge scheduler is an instance of concurrent merge scheduler, which will perform each merge concurrently in separate threads. These, however, are just the defaults. It's very simple to use one of the alternate merge policies and merge schedulers, and it's really not all that difficult to create your own should you have custom needs. Now, you must be wondering, if we can only modify our index by writing new segments, how do we delete documents from existing segments? Well, what actually happens when we delete a document is that the document and its data are not actually removed from its segment. Rather, a document's deletion is merely recorded in a separate file of the segment, and only once that segment is merged does the document's data actually get removed. So documents are actually marked for deletion before they get actually deleted. In either case, once marked for deletion, a document will no longer show up in query results. You may also be wondering how you can update individual fields of a document. Well, the simple answer is that you can't. Once added, a document and all of its fields cannot be modified. What we can do, though, is delete a document and then create a new document to replace it. Unfortunately, this of course can be quite expensive as it requires re-indexing every field. It also requires us to somehow store the data for every field in a document which we might want to modify because we'll need that data to re-index that document. So Lucene is not an efficient solution for storing data that requires fast, frequent updates. Recently, some Lucene developers have proposed changes to allow for updating individual fields, but the functionality is probably still a few years coming. Now that we've covered the basic capabilities and structure of a Lucene index, let's look at how to use the Lucene API. To create and modify a Lucene index, we use the index writer class, and to query a Lucene index, we use the index reader class. Here's a minimal example of using index writer. Just like when working with a file, the index writer operations may throw I.O. exception. When an I.O. exception actually occurs, it might be because of something simple, like not having permission to read or write the index directory, or it might be because of some more serious underlying issue in the system beyond your control. In general, there's not much you can do in your code to correct for such errors, except report the issue. In any case, to create an index writer, we need two objects, a Lucene directory and an index writer config. The Lucene directory class is actually an abstract class. Subtypes include FS directory, as in file system directory, and RAM directory. The FS directory implementation uses an actual directory of storage on disk, while the RAM directory implementation just stores an index entirely in RAM, meaning of course that its data will be lost once the RAM directory is closed. While RAM directory is sometimes useful for temporary indexes, obviously FS directory is the more common choice because we usually want our indexes to persist on disk. So here we're creating an FS directory using the FS directory static method open, passing in a string that specifies the directory of the index. If the specified directory doesn't already exist, FS directory will create it. In truth, FS directory is itself an abstract class with three concrete implementations, each of which have different performance characteristics. The simple FS directory class uses java.io.randomaccess file, while NIOFS directory uses the newer java.nio classes. In theory, NIOFS directory should perform best, but due to a bug in the Java runtime environment, it performs worse on Windows. The FS directory open method knows this and will automatically choose the best implementation for your system. The third implementation, mmap directory, uses memory mapped files, which can improve performance in some cases. Unless you know for sure which implementation will work best for you, you're best off just using the FS directory.open method, as we will in our examples. An index writer config object, as the name implies, specifies options for an index writer. Most options have a default value, but in the index writer config constructor, you must specify a Lucene version and an analyzer. The version is specified with the enum version. Here we specify version 4.6, the most recent version at the time I'm recording this. 
It is a bit odd that you must explicitly specify the version of a library in your code, but the idea is that this requirement helps compatibility between different versions and prevents data corruption. For the analyzer, here we create an instance of standard analyzer, the most commonly used Lucene analyzer. Notice that the standard analyzer constructor requires a Lucene version as well. Because we pass the analyzer to the index writer config constructor, the fields of any documents we add with this index writer will by default be analyzed by this instance of standard analyzer. So once we have an index writer, we can add documents to the underlying index by creating a document object and passing it to the index writer add document method. Before adding the document object to the index, we add fields with the document add method, which expects an instance of the Lucene field class. Here we create a document with two fields, one called content with the text rubber baby buggy bumper, and the other called author with the text Joseph Conrad. In both cases, we elect not to store the text. If we want full control over the options for a field, we can use the field class, but for the most common sets of options, we use one of the several subclasses of the field class. I won't go into the details, but here we use the subclass text field, which tokenizes the text, and the subclass string field, which does not. So the text rubber baby buggy mumper will get analyzed, while Joseph Conrad will not. After making changes to our index with an index writer, we must commit the changes to the index before they will show up in search queries. The commit operation ensures that all of the new data actually gets written to disk before returning, so a commit may be fairly expensive. To commit our changes, we can invoke the index writer commit method. If though, for whatever reason, we wish to discard the changes we've made since the last commit, we can discard those changes with the index writer rollback method. Once we're done with our index writer, we should close it. The index writer close method commits all changes to the index, then possibly waits for some segment merging, and lastly closes all files the index writer had open. Recall that the merge policy decides what segments to merge, if any, every time new segments are created. So if, by creating new segments, the index writer happens to trigger some merging, the close method may take a while to return. Because of this, and because close also first performs a commit, it is often best to avoid closing index writer instances and instead reuse the same index writer instance as much as possible. Now, for a single Lucene index, we can only have one index writer open at any one time. When created, an index writer grabs a lock on the index to prevent other index writers from using that index. In contrast, we can have any number of index readers open on a single Lucene index. Understand that this rule applies across the whole system, not just within a single Java process. We can have multiple processes simultaneously reading from the same Lucene index, but the index writer lock only allows one writer across all processes to access a particular index at any one time. So let's look now at how to create and use an index reader. The index reader class itself is actually abstract. We'll only cover the concrete subclass directory reader, which serves the common case of reading an index from a file system directory. Rather than directly construct a directory reader object, we obtain one from the static method open, to which we pass a Lucene directory object. Now, while an index reader has low-level methods for reading the index, such as for retrieving individual documents by their ID number, to run queries, we need an index searcher to wrap our index reader. Index Searcher has several search methods, the most simple of which returns a specified number of the top scoring results for the given query. The results are returned as a top docs object, which is a collection of score doc objects, each of which contains a document ID and the score that document was given in the query. Here, we're performing a search for the 20 top documents with the term doorknob in the field content, and then printing their IDs and scores. The query itself is specified as an instance of the abstract class query. Here we use the concrete subclass term query, which requires a term object specifying a field along with the term text. Other query types include wildcard query, prefix query, fuzzy query, phrase query, term range query for matching all terms in an alphabetic range, numeric range query for matching all terms in a numeric range, and boolean query for combining multiple queries. Because we discussed the essence of these different queries earlier, I won't belabor how exactly to use them in Lucene. Be very clear that the document collection returned by a query includes only the IDs of the documents rather than any of the stored fields of those documents. To look up the stored fields of a document, we can use the document method of our index reader, passing in the ID to get back a document object. The get method of a document will return the name stored field as a string. Here, we print the stored value of the author field of the top 20 documents matching our query. 
Understand that accessing stored fields is relatively costly, though as mentioned briefly before, Lucene offers two mechanisms for faster lookups, field caches and doc values, which can speed up certain use cases. So that's the basic usage of index writers and index readers. The last thing we'll cover is a very important point about the relationship between the two. Somewhat surprisingly, each index reader always sees the snapshot state of the index at the time of the reader's creation, no matter what gets changed afterwards. In other words, each index reader instance only sees the documents that were committed before its own creation, not any that were committed afterwards. And even when documents get deleted by a writer, those documents will still show up in queries performed by any reader that was opened before their deletion. So anytime we want to query the up-to-date state of the index, we have to open a new reader. Because committing changes and opening and closing writers and readers takes a fair amount of processing time and I.O. work, Lucene performance is most optimized for cases where we don't need to update the index frequently, or at least don't need our queries to always reflect the updated state of the index. In recent years, however, Lucene has attempted to rectify this deficiency with a feature called Near Real-Time Search, a mechanism to quickly and cheaply create new index readers that reflect the latest index changes. The trick is that index writers that write to disk now also temporarily store changes to an extra in-memory index such that a reader can read this in-memory index to see all the latest changes, even those which haven't yet been committed, without the normal overhead of opening a new disk-based reader. In effect, then, the index writer can cheaply produce index readers that reflect all of the latest changes, even those which have not yet been committed. To get one of these cheap readers from an index writer, we use the same directory reader open method, except we pass in the index writer and a Boolean value. The Boolean value specifies whether we need the returned reader to be up to date with the deletes since the last commit. It turns out that making the reader up to date with deletes may require some I.O. work and so may incur some overhead. If you can't tolerate this overhead, but can tolerate results that may include recently deleted documents, then you should pass the argument false. 